rooms, and, and we got pulled back into the main room right before she was ex starting to discuss what those uh, what those strategies were. And I'd love to um, pull her into this conversation because um, she was going to have them uh, talk about uh, so she was at this point in the semester where the students start doing demos of their skills. And typically they do that on each other, but in the remote environment, they are looking for other people. And I had asked them if they are um, practicing all of the precautionary um, sort of safe um, interactions or, or not. So Colleen, you wanna tell us what you were about to say? You started, you're going to discuss that or? Sure. So um, I think to your question, if we do, we're, we're going to try to do video demonstrations of skills, but we have to make sure that our students have access to somebody that they feel safe with since they will be within the six feet of social distancing. So once we're over yeah. that hurdle, um, all the other precautions like face masks, um, shields, and those kind of things, that will be more for our students in their um, clinicals. And in our courses, we do have a segment in one of our courses about donning and doffing um, protective equipment. So we, we do have that in the, in the works. Thank you. Thanks, and I was in group three, but uh, we had interesting discussion in there. Would one of you like to share from group three? What, group three? Oh, sorry. I did a bit of the sharing there. I just I'm t I teach um, anatomy at the vet school, so maybe a little bit akin to Colleen, where it's a very hands-on course, so it's been um, challenging to say the least to teach a um, anatomy course uh, online and the the feeling of I was the one who wrote feeling disconnected because in particular in my case it's for, it's um four instructors that teach this course and my main activity usually is spending wonderful quality time every three hours a week with the students and we don't have that and we decided to go all asynchronous just because of their um, synchronous responsibilities in other courses and large animal anatomy is is two credit. They've already had small animals, so we, we're trying to decrease that amount of stress and time management, that kind of thing. So it was. I, I feel very disconnected from the students. So that was. That's been my my main um, complaint, if you will, our main <laughs> challenge with online learning. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, being the disconnection was some of the things that we talked about earlier. So, do we want to talk about strategies? John, do you want to share the um, active teaching lab sheet? Sure. In the chat right now, we've got, I just posted again, a link to the um, Active Teaching Lab uh, activity sheet, rather. And in this session, let's see, I will post the, I will share that document right now. Sharing my Chrome tab here. So we started talking about, because a number of people had a concern about feeling disconnected and having students that are disappearing. So that might be a good topic to start on while we're doing that. If you could pull up to the um, tips too. All right. And so these are these are five tips. If you have there will be other tips, of course. Um, some of these might address some challenges that you're having. Some of them might not. Um, but that's okay. Um, Communication, clear, frequent communication. Um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, regular in face-to-face -face instruction, students have that sort of routine. They have that um, rhythm of the course. And they, they know that on Tuesday and Thursday at this time, they've got to be involved in that. In an asynchronous session especially, it's really hard for them to sort of get into a routine because if, if they're not prompted to. So clear communication nudges of like, don't forget you have to do this, or don't forget you have to do this, help them stay on track. 
Um, I know I always hear from faculty that they're concerned that they're communicating too much, but um, as long as it's for a good reason, and I try to do a variety of communications. I might do an announcement, then I might do an email uh, for the group, but then I also do individual ones using SpeedGrader to the people who aren't participating and send a little note from SpeedGrader. I see you didn't have a chance to participate in this. Is there, can I help you or what's going on? And that one gets, of all of the communications, that one always gets uh, the biggest response because it, Speed Grader does a nice thing of making it look like it's personal from you to them. I could send the same message to 10 students, but it goes to all of them and it looks like I'm sending it directly to them. And that's the one that I usually get the comment from, but I, I, I do try a variety of different communications and, and that is helpful. So don't feel like you're over communicating because in the online environment, uh, I, I think variety of communications might be a better word. It re it really is, uh, and if you think about in face to face, there's all of the nonverbal communications that we just sort of assume or we don't think about, um, and in the online environment, you need to figure out substitutes for that. So even if it's a nice little nudge or a nice little, oh, I see you haven't seen done this yet, those are those are important for people um, who right now might be feeling starved for attention, starved for some sort of human contact, and if you can't give them a physical contact, you know, or that they're not be able to get that from their family and friends. Um, here's a way for you to to help them get at least that voice or that the verbal contact, um, even if it's via text. And some people are doing, and some are, and some aren't are doing the um, virtual collaboration. Peter, you mentioned that that worked out better better than you thought. Do you want to just quickly share what you shared with our group about how you've been incorporating a little more synchronous and that's been helpful for you? Yeah, sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. I, um, you know, like, so I've been implementing a team-based learning approach and so um, we get together in the main room and then break out into um, breakout rooms where the teams can do their small group discussion and problem solving. And I, you know, I, it's, um, it's been working out really well, I think, because um, you know that has preserved some kind of socializing at a distance rather than social distancing. You know, like so. Um, so I purposefully um, left the structure of the way I had organized the course um, intact to to see whether um, I could reduce the anxiety throughout the semester, you know, because they, obviously towards the end in a lot of classes, there is anxiety that builds up throughout the semester. And so I've been trying to pay attention to exactly that point um, by having the social, uh, by, by having the synchronous communication intact and by, you know, spreading out the assignments and the, the grade weights over the semester as a whole, so that my final exam only takes up maybe 10 or 15 percent of their final grade. So I think it, it has worked in general. You said your students didn't feel as stressed out as you thought they would be because of that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it's part of they know what's coming, right? They know what to expect. So yeah, that's great. And the second tip, uh, synchronous activities, asynchronous. This is um, important as our schedules get messed up and, um, you know, some of us, uh, not I, but some people have kids at home who are now taking a time that was previously um, the kids were in school, but now they're not in school and so it interact interferes with your synchronous course schedule. So how are they, how are you helping them sort of um, work around that? Um, moving to the asynchronous is a good way to do that, but if you do that, it interrupts again that routine. So there's, there's a there's a back and forth to, to consider as you decide what can you move to asynchronous and what should you keep synchronous. Um, and then the ability, that's also the need to really structure that because it isn't as, free flow as you might want and so it does have to be more structured in the online environment to help people know what to expect 
and how they might respond. You know, because I, I had a lot of people who get really great first posts from instructor, from students. I'm sorry, from students, but then the second one is I agree or I disagree or something, something like that. But if you provide guidance on what you would like them to do with that, how they would like to respond or take a role, you had some good ideas of roles, John. You want to mention some of those in in discussions? Yeah. So in in, in uh this idea is they won't come across this on their own. So you have to sort of say, all right, I want you, person one, to to agree with the author and you, person two, to disagree with the author. And you both have to bring in like extra sources of information that you found on that. Person number three, you have to be the mediator. You have to sort of say, sort of say here's how we can do both, A and B. That's kind of a hard role to be able to find the, the third way. And then number four, person, your job is to be a troll. And in some ways, you know, we know you're not really a troll. We know that you're just giving this um, performance for us, but it sort of, it, it adds some of that levity to it. And it also helps the, everybody in the group sort of get used to the idea that in real life, we're going to be trolled. And what are some reactions that I can do that are appropriate and civil um, in responding to that? That was my, my four roles suggestion. And also putting them in the roles of whatever discipline you're in too, having right. them be, be uh, the role of, you know, you know, the uh, customer versus the employee, or you could have them do a variety of different roles based on the content that you have as well. Yeah, different areas of expertise. Yeah, and of course, number with number two, you also do that because of bandwidth issues that we talked about um, right at the at the start of this session. Um, Number three, multiple options. This is good universal design for learning. Um, some people really like talking face to face. Some people like to think and type stuff in and proofread it before they respond. Um, it also gives them a chance to um, find the means that work best for them. So that's another one. Um, number four, again, with bandwidth, the idea of chunking into small pieces is both good as far as learning research, smaller chunks, carried on throughout, uh, distributed throughout the semester or throughout the period is, is great. Larger chunks, they're hard to focus on. People lose track of, of what was said the first few minutes at, after the 15th minute or so. Um, so chunk them into small pieces. And then this might be, I think, one of the biggest ones. Don't make assumptions on what your students are doing. Ask them. Build these opportunities for them to respond um, as much as you can into the sessions themselves, into the assignments. Um, give them, as, as John Parrish did, that frequently asked questions um, or a, a, a space, a, a online forum to be able to ask each other, um, connect them with each other. So recognize that some of them already have these clicks informally that you don't know about. They're on we, uh, WhatsApp together or uh, GroupMe, but those are small groups that aren't formalized. And there are a couple of students, many students maybe in your classes that don't have, they're not part of those cliques, so they don't enjoy the support that the cliques have. So figure out ways in your instruction to sort of formalize these groupings together so that the loners have a chance to sort of be uh, brought in as, to the conversations as well. I wanted to add something about the low bandwidth. I just shared a quick tip that was shared on the instructional continuity, and I tried to get on there, but I didn't succeed. Uh, another one that we don't feel, we don't have to do video or audio all the time. Text in Canvas works really well too. So you don't have to always do video lectures. I do a lot of text lectures, and the, the value of that is that if you have to make a slight change or edit, you can easily do that. If you do that in a video and you see you have to make a change, you have to redo it. So just even simple text or PowerPoint notes and things like that are fine. You don't have to always do video and audio for it. And that would help all the students with the low bandwidth issues as well. And, and editing is another reason to chunk things into, like even the videos that you do, into smaller pieces. So you don't have to redo the whole 51 minute lecture or 50 minute lecture, you can just redo that two minute chunk. Um, so it, it makes it easier. The smaller the pieces, the easier things are to handle and to download. All right, so now's the sort of the heart of, of, of the session. We invite you to jump into a, an empty space here and type a question after one of these red cues. And if you have answers, 
Um, this one says, and we will respond, but I want to invite you to respond as well. So if somebody types in a question and you have an answer, go ahead and type it in. And even if it's not the right answer, it's a suggestion. It's a, it's a thing that we can talk about a little bit more. If you see somebody's question that you really like and you're like, oh, I, I have the same question as well, right at the beginning here, add a plus. And that way we'll know that multiple people are having this question and we'll make sure that we prioritize that one. I like the first one already. How can you help students build good time management skills for asynchronous coursework? Uh, and I'm probably the worst one to talk because I like work all the time, so I'm never <laughs> always good at that. But in this document here, uh, down below, we have a thing called a rhythm um, template, and we have a couple different ones that you can choose. We suggest that you build a rhythm for your course on that you have certain things happen at certain times. That always, the, always that you would always have your discussion post open at a certain time. That you would have a close at a certain time. That you would post your quizzes at a certain time if, uh, of the week. And then you put this into a rhythm chart, and it's good for both you and students. So we recommend that you use this to plan your course and then share that with your students as well. So when we're teaching a course, we try to have the same rhythm. Okay, we have an asynchronous discussion on this day, the next day the module opens, that it's the same. So if you keep it the same, because they have a lot of courses to consider, and also you can use the nice uh, scheduling tool that's in Canvas, and if you put a due date in your assignment, it automatically puts it on that schedule, and students can see that, and they can link that to their schedule as well. So any other ideas people have had to what else have others used to help students with their time management? Because that is a, probably one of the worst situations for students right now, because they are doing this for all of their courses. So they have to keep track of everybody's courses. So if everybody used that scheduling tool, they would have all of their assignments in one nice schedule, which would be nice. Anyone else have tried uh, anything for good time management skills for students? Any other suggestions? No other suggestions? Colleen. Go ahead. Uh, Karen, this is Colleen. Um, Hi, Colleen. I Hi, Karen. I don't know if Hi. suggestion. Um, in creating my course for the summer, I am, I don't know if this is overkill, but I'm trying to be very explicit and give almost to do lists like Monday through Friday. And, and kind of to your point, just understand the time commitment that will be involved with the course. That's an excellent idea. I also do that uh, when I, when we, Karen and I teach, teach online, we try to list even how much time we think things will take uh, to do to kind of give them a rough estimate. It's always rough, but giving, we have a to-do list that we give them a scheduling sheet. Um, Karen, would you mind posting one of them in there? I can grab it right now, but um, we have a little Google schedule thing that says, this is what's due, how many points, when it's due, well, you know, how much time approximately it will take. Of course, we had the luxury of over time asking people about how long things took, because for us, it may take us half the time as a student, so you may want to double that time for students. No, that's an excellent idea. Um, that's a wonderful thing to do. You can't, providing something like that, I bet you're going to get a lot of thank yous from students for providing that type of thing. Well, I, th I think the other reason for doing it, I like the time idea, so I might um, try to do that as well. And, and thank you for the doubling, because that's probably a really good point. But this is a brand new cohort, so I think that's kind of part of the impotence for doing it as well because they're they're just brand new and getting thrown into the online learning with kind of these um, hands-on skills so it'll be interesting so the nice thing about the communicating to the students the time expectations that you do Colleen is this also helps the students recognize that huh I did this whole thing in 30 minutes and they said that it would take an hour maybe I should go back in and spend a little bit more time because maybe I'm missing something um, because it doesn't, because it didn't take in this time. Um, it's possible that they could say, oh, I'm just that much better that I was able to do this in half the amount of time 
but it might be a, a clue or cue to them that maybe they're missing something. Aaron just pasted our summer schedule, so those teaching fully online, if you can still join us by the end of April 30th, this is what you'll be doing. <laughs> but that's what we provide. We provide a list of the activities that they would be doing, uh, uh, you know, approximate time, when it's due, when the synchronous sessions are due, and we share that many times. We put that in the news announcement, we put it in an email, we put it in uh, when we send a reminder, so we we use that same document so we don't have to keep saying this is due then, this is due then. We just, uh, and then of course it's in the it's in the calendar as well, so they have it there and they also get a reminder because it's a due date. So they get lots of reminders on when things are due and so far no one's complained. They are thankful for it, but uh, it, you know, they, they do see that. So that's the tool that we use. So what other questions do we have here, John, we should address? Oh, how about let's just move right on down the line to the uh, the lighthearted fun moments into the virtual professional settings. This is tricky, right? And and again, it's different in a face-to-face -face session versus a uh, an online session. Um, you notice that when you came in today, you probably came into a discussion that was already happening. And I had started having sort of small talk with, with John Parrish about um, some of the questions that he was working on. In some ways, this you're walking into a room then, if, if you hear that, that isn't dead. You're not walking into the sort of sacred space of the online classroom. And any classroom that you've ever walked into, probably, as you walk into it before the class starts, there's the hubbub of people talking and having side conversations. Um, one of the ways that we do this here is when people come in, I might say, I might chat with them on the side and say, hey, welcome, how are you doing today? And I did that with uh, several of you this morning or this afternoon. That's another way to sort of do the small talk and get that uh, air of informality or the air of formality out of there and help people sort of say, oh, I'm here with other humans. They, they, they recognize me, they see me, they communicate with me. Um, who did the bloopers reel? I want to hear about that. Put on your microphone and tell us about your bloopers reel. Oh, that was me. Awesome. <laughs> that was me. Yeah, no, I, I so I, I'm the one who teaches large animal anatomy, so I feel very disconnected from the students. I really tried to make, actually, in both my recorded lecture that I did on PowerPoint, as well as um, I did three little um, modules on the anatomy of the hoof and I one of them I made so many mistakes and the cat kept on interrupting and whatnot so I just left all those in there at the end my husband um, edited them really nicely into this like one minute bloopers reel at the end which was very well received I did get quite a few comments about how much fun that was to see you know me yelling at the cat and hearing her meowing in the background as she's rattling all of the uh, patio uh, blinds and whatnot so so just so, stuff, little, little things like that this is lovely in so many ways because it shows you're human. It it models mistake making. So uh, the John Parrish talked about this at the beginning, or maybe it was in the session, uh, that none of the students want to make mistakes. Um, so they don't want to show their thinking behind this. They don't want to. They need to give the right answer. And by modeling, you know that you, you know, the teacher, the the authority on this, can make mistakes as well helps set the, the, the tone that it's okay, this is a learning environment, not a performance environment. We will have a performance element of this in our summative assessment, but for the most part, it's, it's about making mistakes. It's about learning via those mistakes. I love that. All right, how about the vacation photos? Were they just in the yeah, presentation? This is Margaret. Uh, yeah, yeah go ahead. it was uh, it was it was really great because you know how how many times have you just sat there and watched a presentation and your mind you know drifts off onto something else and I it, it wasn't you know it wasn't overbearing it was just two or three but he would just take a break from the content and say things like oh well here's a picture of me on my vacation no one else wants to see these photos but I thought you might enjoy it you know funny that way right 
And it, it worked. I mean, it, it, it woke everybody up and, and he could tell a funny story and then we would move on. It, it, was, a, it was a good technique. And again, it shows that the, the, the person in the room talking at you has more of a life than their content of the course. So they're human. That's awesome. Yeah. Very good. All right, who wants to? Oh, then, and, and so this idea, I love this. Um, they're having the students share, in some ways you're having them share strategies as well. Um, and that might help address their time management things so they can teach each other some of the time management tricks that they've figured out. If you think about what happens in the residence halls right now or in this face-to-face -face conversations, so many of how do I learn those techniques, they learn from each other. And some of them are terrible um, and some of them are good. So, but you need to have sort of a lot of examples of that. So setting up some sort of a forum for them to, to share that is, is, is a great idea. All right. Another question, how do you deliver an exam online to 500 students and try to minimize cheating, slow loading of the quiz on Canvas, and accommodate all of the different student schedules? If you can figure out the answer to this, you should go <laughs> talk to the vice pros for teaching and learning because that whole office is trying to struggle with this right now. Um, in a face-to-face -face classroom, we have some semblance of control, right? Everybody has the same desk. Everybody has the same lighting. Everybody has the same Wi-Fi elements. You can kind of say to everybody, okay, we're going to be quiet for the next 45 minutes while you study at this. Um, in an online environment, all of those things are off, and it's hard for the students. Um, I would say instead of um, minimize cheating, to find creative ways of, of solving the questions that you're asking them, right? Or of coming up with an answer. Um, they're, they're being resourceful. Um, but how do you handle the slow loading of a quiz when some of your students have fiber internet and this beautiful office and high-speed computers and others are, as we said earlier, in the parking lot of McDonald's, you know, maybe with two screaming kids in their back seat that they have to take care of who are constantly interrupting them, kicking at the back of their seat, spilling ice cream cones, et cetera, et cetera. That's, a, that's an inequitable situation. So can your quiz or your Canvas um, final exam accommodate both of those situations in a fair way? Does anyone have ideas on that? Karen. This Karen or the other Karen? <laughs> I saw your name go on. Or your oh, microphone my name, on. oh, my microphone go on. Well, join us tomorrow. We're having a session on assessment, and we'll also have join us uh, those who are in charge of the examity project, too, where you can get proctored exams. But you can also do this in many other ways using Canvas, such as, uh, and, and we share this in the, maybe you want to share the assessment um, sheet as well, because it provides uh, lots of ideas, and the Instructional Continuity website provides a ton of ideas on how you can do your exam, such as changing, you know, the, the questions so you, they don't get the same questions, having a question bank, having um, um, also doing, making that the answers are, are changed and or that the order of the questions also. So there's many different ways that you can do that in Canvas. Um, and we have a whole list of them on both the Instructional Continuity website as well. So. They are a lot of good ideas, but we highly recommend that you consult with the assessment team that we have pulled together and come tomorrow if you can, because that would be a great question to ask at that time. And there is also a video on Examity in, uh, posted in this course, right, Karen? You have it posted here, too, that will provide information about that. And working up to that, think about your exam and, and try to figure out how much of really needs to be synchronous in the sort of high stakes environment and what what can you do to um, take pieces out of it that don't have to be synchronous high stakes maybe you can have some of them be sort of work on your own quizzes leading up to that final exam maybe some of the assessment can be worked out as projects or in a, uh, an online forum where they share ideas and resources so 
do you have to have the traditional, you know, 50 minute high stakes book closed and pencils out sort of exam, or can parts of it be moved to other means so that you don't have to put the extra stress on those students that are going to be in the McDonald's parking lot? Um, and maybe you can minimize that. And that's what Peter was just saying. He had a much smaller percent, but I know you're at the end of the semester. It might be difficult to do those kind of things at this time and date, but if yeah. you're teaching for summer or later on, uh, all of those are great ideas. And if you're stuck with this high stakes exam that you have to provide now, these uh, there are some tips that we'll provide tomorrow in the assessment lab, but a lot of them are are posted online as well, yeah, in instructional continuity website. Good, we're at the hour, so we'll we'll stop the recording at this point, but we'll stay on.